Today we want to talk about the cross and the resurrection. Um, this is what Watchman Nee said. He spent. He was a Chinese Christian. He spent lots of time in jail. He's written some amazing books. I I, I, I encourage. Uh, one is a really short one. He's, it's, it's called Christ, the Spiritual Sum of All Things. It's an amazing short book. And in the book, he says, I don't have peace. I have Jesus. I don't have joy. I have Jesus. And so he, 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 he brings together the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit with the person of Jesus. And, and so I, re I recommend that. But this is what he says. Our old history ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the resurrection. There's this another man, a theologian. He says this. The empty tomb of Christ has been the cradle of the church. Here's one. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is not a faith issue. It's a historical fact. We're living uh, with, with that reality today. That today is not just for the people of faith. It's not just for Christians. Historically, it's a fact. It's not arguable. It's just reality. And so it's interesting to know because sometimes, you know, the media in America, you know, it wants to push Christians out of the conversation and it wants to marginalize us like we're, like we're some tiny little minority. And they're absolutely out of their minds. It's just we're so silent and we're so quiet and we're so tame and we're so nice and we stick our tail between our legs and we just walk away that that's what they think about us but there's more than I think three hundred there's there's a couple I think a hundred million Christians in America Could you imagine if they woke up woke up woke up the church uh, this is the, one of the most uh, wealthy churches the most wealthy church in all of human history the amount of damage we could do to the kingdom of darkness with what is available to us right now is stunning, but most people are asleep at the wheel. Asleep. So we're saying, wake up. We're living in amazing times with amazing opportunities, and we're going to we're gonna we're gonna pursue them, we're gonna go after them. We're gonna go after them. So the resurrection of Christ, let's talk about this from a doctrinal, uh, a truth point of view here. The scriptures uh, give credit to the resurrection of Christ. Let me say it this way. The Bible credits the resurrection of Jesus to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The scriptures also define a unique attribute of God being used in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus said this, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. That's a really, really bold statement for a human being to say. I am the resurrection. Remember when Lazarus was dead, you hear Jesus go, Lazarus, come forth. Remember that? If he wouldn't have just said Lazarus, the whole graveyard would have woke up. He is the resurrection. Everything that he speaks to has to listen to him. Amen. Come on. Oh, That's right. No, no, no. I want. We need to remember. Remember, yes, he was a man, but he was also fully God. He said to the most powerful government in the world, "You would have no authority over me if it wasn't given to you." Come on. He said to to a hundred of the baddest Roman soldiers that came to get him. He said, "No man takes my life." I lay it down and a hundred of them fell on their rear ends. And he was illustrating, you're not taking my life. I'm laying it down. He also said to them, I can call a legion of angels right now to come and slaughter you basically. Now I just want to, because sometimes we see Jesus, he's like, Jesus is so nice. Jesus is so sweet. And sometimes we forget Jesus is God. Amen. <laughs> Jesus is God. So Jesus says this bold thing, I am the resurrection. He says this, I have the authority, this is the word he used, authority, to take my life, to lay my life down and to take it up. I am the resurrection. So the scripture says that it was the, it was the word it uses in Greek is the word doxa, which is where we get doxology. 
But it, it was the glory of the Father that rose Jesus from the dead. You can check John 17, 5 to make sure I'm not teaching anything crazy. Uh, in John 10, 18, Jesus said, I have the authority to lay my life down and I have the authority to take my life up again. In Romans 1, 4, it says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead, by the Spirit of holiness. Which is fascinating. I want to show you that in the book of Revelation, there's two witnesses that are killed. And it's the spirit of life that raises them up from the dead. But with Jesus' resurrection, it was not the spirit of life. It was the spirit of holiness that raised him from the dead. Which is another message for another time. But I want you to show you how God works with himself. How God is in agreement with himself. How God partners with himself in his redemptive plan. God is fully in agreement. Now, what's fascinating about the Scripture is the Scripture uh, is very, very detailed in um, its description. And one of the things that we have to realize, because many of us come from a Pentecostal tradition where people speak in tongues and fall on the floor and act weird, and we think that spontaneous is spirit-led. That's, that's the, the mindset we have. You hear people say stupid things like, it was so good that no one preached. And it's just like, did you ever read Acts 2? It was so good that Peter preached and 3,000 people were saved. It's just, we say ridiculous things because we don't know what we're talking about. And so the scripture here is really, really detailed in using a specific attribute of God at work within the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So there's a reason why this, why God wants us to know that it's the glory of the Father. It's the majesty of the Father. It's for the Father's honor that His Son would be raised from the dead. And with Jesus, it's a word authority, exousia in Greek, which is influence. Like, Jesus has influence over life and over death. So it's authority. And that same word authority is what He says that He's given us to go into the world with. That authority. And with the Holy Spirit, it's interesting, it's power. Power, like, you know, power that run. you know, it's, 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 no, it's dunamis rather, it's miracle working power. So, the glory and the honor and the majesty of the Father and the Son's authority and the Son's influence and the Spirit's power is what took Jesus out of a grave. And it, the scripture uses a very specific language because it wants us to understand how the attributes of God work together in His will and how He works things out for the counsel of His own will and how He, when, when it says that in Ephesians, that God works things out after the counsel of His own will, it's almost like He talks to Himself and then executes, kind of like we do, you know? We're, we talk to ourselves, right? Do we do that? You do, right? When you're going to lift something heavy, what do you do? You're like, yeah, I got this. You know, you talk to yourself, right? I'm not crazy. So God literally talks to himself. And so uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, I want to keep this. I want to talk about what this really means. What does the resurrection mean to us? Because often we, 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 we go into the Word and we hear stuff. And at the end of the day, we're like, what does this actually mean to me? Like, Okay, it's great that I know that it's the Father's glory, the Son's authority, the Spirit's power, but what does that mean to me Tuesday afternoon when I want to kill my boss or when I want to quit my job or when I want to, you know, when I want to go absolutely crazy? What does that mean that the, the Father's glory is not helping me when my rent is due? Are you following me? So then there's real life, right? Real life smashes in on our door tomorrow at 9 a.m. And we have... Uh, the book of Peter says that we've been begotten to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Which means, think of that when a child is born, right? They, for, for some of you who are parents, you've, you've seen this, but they take this little child and they clean them up and do their thing. And then they put them into this incubator type room type like thing. You know, and then that they go from there to being circumcised if you're going to do that. And, and so, so, Think of being born into a living hope. Think of 
Think of a living hope as like the incubator of what you're born into. So the new creation was born into the atmosphere, into the environment of a living hope. So, you're not born, this is like when you're born again, when you come into salvation, when you find, when Jesus finds you and, and you receive him and you're in that transaction of faith and you, he puts grace toward you and you put your faith in him and, and, and new life comes into you, you're born into a living hope. So, you live in a different ecosystem. You live with different desires. You live with different possibilities. You live in a different environment. That's right. Amen. Amen. Does that does that make sense? Yes. So you live in a greenhouse. In fact, you live in a place where uh, the book of Revelation says that it bears fruit 12 months of the year. Different fruit. So you're always bearing fruit and it's always diverse and it's always different. So you live in an environment that is continuously fruitful. Amen. We were born into a living hope. So because Jesus got out of the grave, my hope is alive. Because Jesus is alive, Jesus is my hope, I've been born into a living hope, which infects how I look at tomorrow. Right? Right? How, what it, faith affects right now. Hope affects tomorrow. That's right. So we, we, we have a, a... You could say the word optimistic, but optimistic is not big enough to describe hope. It's, it's bigger than optimism. It's eternal optimism. It's like the increase of his government will know no end. Things are just going to get better and better. But we, we think, this is the problem, we think they're going to get worse and worse. <sighs> so, I, I, I had a... Anyway, no, I'm not going to go there. Um, Matthew 17. Jesus takes his three best guys up to a mountain. He doesn't show this to everybody. He starts to pray. And he begins to shine like the sun at noonday. Moses and Elijah appear. The, the book of Luke says he talked to them about his decease and what he would accomplish in Jerusalem. He, it, it talks about his death as an accomplishment. Why? He is the resurrection. So death was an accomplishment because he is the resurrection and the life. See, Jesus, when he hung on the tree, Jesus wasn't killed. Jesus gave his life. He says this, Into your hands I commit my spirit, which means from the cross, hanging on a tree, naked, he was able to put the life that gave his physical body life into the hands of God the Father. When Stephen was being stoned in Acts 7, he said, Lord, receive my spirit. Lord, receive me. Jesus didn't have to say receive me. He said, into your hands I put my spirit. Because he knew who he was, he knew where he came from, and he knew where he was going. It's, a, it's very different language. I, I want to exalt Jesus as, as, as much as we can. We want to always let people know that Jesus is like God. He, he, yes, he was a human, but he was God. He was every bit God. Um, and so anyway... So Jesus begins to shine like the sun. And these guys are, are just like, you know, they're, you know, they have an idea to do a building project. And uh, Jesus is like, don't tell anyone about this vision until I'm raised from the dead. That's what it says. Until I'm raised from the dead. And what was Jesus showing them? Jesus was showing them the resurrection. He was showing them who he was. I am the resurrection. He was showing them what he would look like physically after the resurrection. He was showing them the resurrection before he died. Why? Because he was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. So you have future, you have past, present, and future. He transcends through all of that. 
I am, I, he, he was, I, I wa was, is, and is to come. He transcends time. So he was showing them who he is. And he said, no, this revelation is not to be shared until I'm risen from the dead. Because he was showing them what he would look like. John uh, 21, what does the resurrection mean to us? It means restoration. It means transformation. It means we live with a living hope. Um, John 21, which I was going to try to get into, and I still might try to do it, um, he restores Peter back to a place of, of authority and ministry after he's failed terribly. Which, to me, that's very reassuring. I don't know. For perfect people, maybe they don't like, you know, John 21. For all of the imperfect people who are dysfunctional and crazy and do things impetuously and make mistakes and say things they wish they hadn't of and, and stuff like that, that we love John 21. I, it's one of, I just love it because I just identify with the brokenness of Peter and with, uh, with his craziness because I, I, I feel just like that. So the resurrection means restoration. It means not only are we forgiven, but we're restored back to our position. I'm going to get into that in a minute. But it doesn't just mean that for us. It also means that for all of creation. One day, He'll make all things new. It says that there'll be a new heaven. And then it says that there'll be a new earth. Why? Anywhere Satan has ever been will be made totally new. Now, Ephesians 1.19, literally the most powerful verse in the whole Bible. And you're like, how can you say that? Well, I'll explain to you in a second. But in Ephesians 1.19, it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand? So, you have in Ephesians 1, verse 19, you have four Greek words used for power. Four Greek words used for power. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says that God holds all things together by the word of His power. That's one word for power. One word. It's the word dunamis, power. So it takes one of God's powers to hold the whole entire planet in motion. But there are four of God's powers that it took to raise Jesus from the dead. But that doesn't end there. Those four powers, because Jesus was risen from the dead, is at work within you and is at work toward you. So God is active in you and He's releasing His power toward you to compel you and to move you by His Spirit. The four words are dunamis, Energeia, Kratos, and another one is Iskusos, which I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. And those four words, uh, dunamis means miraculous power. Energeia is where we get the word energy from, which means efficiency, energy, operation. The word Kratos is the word vigor, power, dominion, strength. And the last power is the word Iskusos, which is ability. It's the ability of God. But not only the ability of God, this is a really cool one for people who like sports. It's also the word forcefulness. You, have you ever seen a football player hit another football player and just manhandle him? Like just totally just own him, just bang and just, you know, stand over him like that. Like the forcefulness of God is at work within me. The energy of God is at work within me, which means, literally, I can be sitting next to someone who is not born again. They can be tired, and we can be doing the same exact thing, but I have something different at work within me. Something different that I have access to a world that they do not know of, which is why God has called us to serve them. So the resurrection for us means that we have been born into this living hope. It means that we can be totally transformed. It means that God has given us a new heart, a new mind, new desires, new direction, new relationships, new intentions, new, new. We've been totally made new. This is good news. The resurrection for us means... 
we can be restored. We're not just forgiven. We're not just like, okay, the debt has been paid. Your debt could be paid, but you could still be broke. There's plenty of people who have no debt but have no money. What good is it if you have no money? It's not enough to have your debt paid. You got to have money. You have to, it's not just enough to be forgiven. You actually have to be restored back into a position of authority so that you can use that authority to influence and to serve others and to bring people into the kingdom. Now, 1 Peter 1, uh, 1 Peter 3.21 says this, that we have the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead gives me a clear conscience. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead gives me the ability to have a clear conscience. In the Old Testament, the, 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 the sacrifices of the lambs would prolong the judgment of God till next year. He would sprinkle blood on them, but it was never able to clear their conscience. So although they weren't held responsible for their sin, their sin still held them hostage in their mind. The blood of Jesus, but specifically His resurrection, when He gets out of the grave, watch this, when He got out of the grave, the shame and the stain got out of our conscience. You're not what you did. You're not what you did. You're not what was done to you. Because Jesus got out of the grave, that stuff can get out of our mind. It's just that simple. It's that simple. There's no sense of beating it up. It's, it's that simple. So that's what the resurrection means for us. It means that we are empowered. It means that God's power is at work within us. When I'm irritable, when I'm hard to get along with, when I feel angry, when I feel tired, when I feel upset, when I feel like saying, this is ridiculous, why am I even doing this? When you want to quit your job, when you're, whenever you're feeling... Greater than your feelings is God's power, God's ability, God's energy, God, His forcefulness, His dominion. That is at continually at work within you. That's right. If we would live with the awareness of the power of God at work within us, we would live totally differently. Instead of asking God to come down from heaven, we would go outside and let God out. Now, this is something uh, for us who, who used to have demons. Anyone here used to have demons? I think there's some people here who used to have some demons. Mary Magdalene had seven demons. Jesus cast these seven demons out of her. This woman who had seven demons was the first woman, the first person, the first human to lay eyes on Jesus after his resurrection. Wow. Not his apostles. She didn't even have a position. She had no ministry title. She had nothing. She was literally a woman who had lots of demons, who got set free by Jesus. And what I see from this is the person who needed him the most saw him first. How hungry are you? How bad do you know that you need him? I'm going to just tell you the truth. I'll just be totally honest with you. Without Jesus, I would destroy my life in like 3 minutes and 26 seconds. Some of you may last 10 minutes. Some of you may last 2 weeks. 3 minutes and 26 seconds and I would be like self-destruct. You know, this message will self-destruct. That would be like me. 3 minutes. Like a time bomb. Bam. So I'm, I'm going to come and I'm going to lay myself on the floor. Or I'm going to get myself on my knees. Or I'm going to cry my little soul out. I'm going to pursue Jesus. I don't care what anyone thinks. I don't care. I'm going to be that crazy lady looking like, where is he? See, because she knew that she needed him. And she was the one. Now, this is interesting. She was the one who announced to his apostles, his disciples, where he would be. So watch this. The person who needs him most can forecast where he's going. Can forecast what he's doing. Can see where he's going. Wow. 
It's your need that allows you to see. Wow. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on. Like we said a few weeks ago, remember Zacchaeus was short. Remember? His, he was short. He had a problem. He was short. He was a little midget. He couldn't see over the crowd. So his problem is what positioned him and what made him get up in that tree. The same way this woman's need is what allowed her to see. So the pain, the need, the problem, whatever it is, that's the very thing that positions you, that puts you in a place to see, to be seen. Jesus said it this way, those who are forgiven much, love much. To the degree that you've been forgiven, to the degree of the revelation you have of forgiveness, that's the degree that you can operate in the kingdom with. Because the kingdom operates based on forgiveness. It doesn't operate based on anything we earn or deserve. It's all through grace, which is we, it's God chose to have mercy on us so that he could give us grace. Without God being merciful to us, he could not give us grace. Mercy is, not, is us not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. After the resurrection, Jesus did some things. And I want to just hit them quickly. One of the things he did is he spoke to Mary Magdalene, told her where he would be. Then he opened the scriptures to his disciples on the road to uh, Emmaus. And it caused their hearts to burn within them. Then he appeared to the disciples together collectively three times. Then he cooked uh, them breakfast and he restored Peter. Acts 1.3 says that he spoke for 40 days about the kingdom of God. Have you ever felt like God is talking to you about something but you don't understand it? Has anyone ever been there? Yeah. Okay. I've been there. For 40 days, he talked to them about his kingdom. And at the end of 40 days, they still could not get over their national pride. They said to them, when are you going to restore the kingdom of God to Israel? He goes, you, you don't understand. I'm going to turn that temple absolutely upside down. How detestable do you think it was to the Father that they continued to kill lambs after the lamb had been slain? How disrespectful and dishonoring to God the Father was that to openly step on His Son and continue to sacrifice lambs and animals after a perfect sacrifice was sacrificed and God Himself tore the veil. When God tore the veil he, from the top to the bottom, He just said that temple is irrelevant. There's no more access inside that temple. Now we are the temple. They didn't get it. <laughs> That's why it took a persecution in Acts 8 to push them out of Jerusalem. They didn't get it. When are you going to restore the kingdom of God to Israel? You don't understand. He said the kingdom of God would be given to another nation. They couldn't get it. 40 days with a resurrected Jesus. You know why they couldn't get it? Because they didn't want to get it. Forty days with a resurrected Jesus and they couldn't grasp this message of the kingdom of God. He still used them. 